Yes, sir. You know what time it is. Welcome to Count It right here on Points Bet USA. My name is Kazim Famiwide. Thank you so much for joining me today. It is a beautiful Thursday here in New York City, and we got a lot of basketball to discuss, so let's get right into it. Yesterday was the 2023 ESPY Awards, and there was so much. One of my favorite award shows of the year because I got to be honest, you kind of know who's going to win the awards, right? And other award shows, I got to say, kind of get boring after a while. But the ESPYs have always been very nice. And it's because of moments like this. Because you, know, you, you don't really realize how dramatic athletes can be, whether it's comedic, whether it's serious, whether it's any of that, until the ESPY Awards come on. And nothing more dramatic happened in the ESPY Awards than LeBron James officially announcing he is ready to run it back. Yesterday at the 2023 ESPY Awards, LeBron won the ESPY for best record-breaking performance by surpassing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's NBA career scoring record. And um, it was a really beautiful speech, man. He got on stage, and the the people, obviously, the James gang, Savannah, Zuri, uh, Bronny, and Bryce, uh, all introduced LeBron as he received that award. And uh, he had this to say uh, while he was announcing. And, and obviously, you know, you're watching the awards and you think it's just going to be a, a simple acceptance speech. But LeBron said, quote, when the season ended, I, wa- I said I wasn't sure if I was going to keep playing. And I know a lot of experts told you guys what I said, but I'm now here speaking for myself. In that moment, I'm asking myself if I could still play the game without cheating the game. Can I give everything to the game still? Truth is, I've been asking myself this question at the end of the season for a couple of years now. At that point, while I'm watching the speech, I'm like, oh, snap. Is he really about to do I mean, the family's up there. Like, he's getting the award. All his luminaries are right there. And I'm like, damn, is he really, is he really about to do this? So he continues in saying, The day I can't give the game everything on the floor is the day I'll be done. And LeBron James said, lucky for you guys, today is not that day. LeBron officially announcing he will be returning for his 21st NBA season. Of course, he's talking about cheating in the game. There's worse ways to go out on a career than 40 points, 10 rebounds, and 9 assists against the eventual NBA champion Denver Nuggets. So he clearly has a lot left in the tank. However, LeBron just made it known to everybody, and if you looked in the crowd, you've seen a couple of Denver Nuggets sprinkled in there. You see Contavious Caldwell-Pope uh, giving the kind of look and uh, kind of giving a look that we all kind of gave, right? Like, bro, we, we know we know he wasn't retiring. <laughs> like, I understand. Like, it's and, and trust me, 21 years in the game, beautiful family, leaning into a second career as – uh, elite high school basketball coach, filmmaker, producer, director, all these other things. He probably doesn't have much to play for except legacy and end for the love of the game. And clearly he's still got enough left in the tank. And it doesn't necessarily hurt that Rob Palenka, the Lakers general manager, had the offseason of his life. And just gotten so much of an influx of talent, re-signed players that uh, performed well in the second half of the season and the playoffs. So LeBron has all the incentive in the world to say he is all in on the Lakers, at least for this last season. Now, is it his last season? You know, who knows? He has an option after this year, whether he'll stay with the Lakers or possibly go elsewhere. And that obviously lines up with the draft eligibility of his son, Bronny James, which he's been on record as saying how he can't wait to try and play with his son and saying it will be a special thing for him if he can do it. So who knows if this is the last year LeBron James plays basketball? Who knows if this is the last year LeBron James plays basketball for the Los Angeles Lakers? However, as it was announced yesterday, LeBron officially returning for year 21 of the NBA season in very dramatic fashion. I love me a good wrestling promo. I mean, he should he could have went all Mark Henry and, and put on the 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 the, the salmon blazer. 
and body slammed John Cena. I'm sure John Cena was in the crowd. He said, I got a lot left in the tank. I ain't going nowhere. I got a lot left in the tank. Wrestling fans know what I'm talking about. If you don't know, Google Mark Henry, Sam, and Blazer. It was pretty much the exact same thing that happened at the SB Awards. Let's talk about what happened on the court yesterday. Chet Holmgren. Uh, you know, I had some thoughts about the Summer League game yesterday. Didn't think Chet Holmgren was going to play. And boy, did he play. After not playing on Monday night, he suited up Tuesday and dropped 25 points, nine rebounds, and five blocks. Was all over the court, handling the rock, shooting from mid-range, dunking on people, blocking shots, hitting long-range jumpers. I mean, he just looked absolutely sensational. And at this point of Summer League, as much as, you know, you love to build up some of that I guess, team camaraderie going into the year. One thing you got to be wary of if you're the Oklahoma City Thunder, like the Spurs did with Victor Wimbanyama, like the Blazers are probably going to do with Scoot Henderson, and like the Rockets are doing with Amen Thompson. We've seen enough of Chet Holmgren. He doesn't look like he's missed a beat. He looked like he's fully recovered from that injury, and he looks like he's going to be a contributor from day one of the NBA, going to a team that fits a need pretty well. And not only that, you got Jalen Williams, who played pretty well as well. You got Sam Presti just really, really locking in on these draft picks. And uh, Chet Holmgren being the latest of them all, number two overall pick last year, uh, really looked like he is back and better than ever. Uh, he was one of the guys that I thought coming out of Gonzaga could have been one of the best players out of that draft. And obviously the, the body frame is – is going to lead to some questions. But if you look, listen to guys like Victor Wimbenyama, who said, actually, it's a little bit tougher in the Euro League than it is in America, then it'll have, you know, it, it, it leads me to believe that maybe Chet Holmgren is more ready for the NBA uh, than people may realize, despite his body frame. Now, I've watched Chet Holmgren for a long time. I've watched him at the Slam Summer Classics. I've called several of his games at the Peace Jam. And uh, obviously watched him in college. And his slight frame didn't necessarily uh, deter him from being an impact player on both ends of the court. I think the defense is what is going to be an immediate help for that Oklahoma City Thunder team. And the fact that he's going to be playing with two incredible playmakers and in Shea Gilgis-Alexander and Josh Giddy lets you know that all of those wide-open dunks, all of those rolling baskets that he got all day long yesterday – in Summer League against the Summer League Pacers, lets you know that he's probably going to continue to do a lot of that stuff in the big show when it's time for main roster action. But congrats to Chet Holmgren. If I'm the Oklahoma City Thunder, I say I've seen enough. We're good. Don't need you to do no more Summer League. Don't need you to do no no amateur uh, pro-ams and none of that stuff. Chet, you're healthy. The leg's good. The foot's good. Whatever it was, he got hurt. Sit down. The Oklahoma City Thunder are going to need you this season. So if I was him, I'd just hit the gym. I'd eat a few Big Macs. I'd stay in the court and shoot some hoops, get that range right, and uh, be ready to be a contributing team on a fringe playoff team in the Western Conference. Let's talk about James Harden, man. Uh, there's a lot of confusion going on with James Harden. Now, obviously, in the beginning of July, uh, when free agency officially opened up, uh, James Harden opted in with the Philadelphia 76ers and said that he's demanding a trade from the Philadelphia 76ers. Now, let me make sure I got the right quote in front of me right here. James Harden said, uh, well, reports are saying that um, – Yes, Harden's stance has not changed as far as uh, wanting to be dealt from Philadelphia. According to Sam Amick of uh, The Athletic, he said a source close to him told The Athletic he still wants to leave Philadelphia. He's still upset with how Maury handled his situation heading into possible free agency last month. And even with the recent revelation that Harden attended the same MBPA party as Sixers co-star Joel Embiid and former Sixers owner, Sixers owner Michael Rubin in Vegas, he's still determined to start next season in the Clippers jersey. Now, James Harden parties with people all the time, right? Like, that's not 
something new. So I feel like him being at Michael Rubin parties or being at the MBPA parties or being at any of these uh, Vegas parties with some of his teammates probably wouldn't change it. You know, if if you, you had a, if I had a dollar for every NBA player that James Harden partied with, I mean, James Harden was partying with Kevin Durant just weeks after he was traded from the Brooklyn Nets, so it's usually no harm, no foul. It's just business. And I think business-wise, James Harden wants to go to the L.A. Clippers. He wants to be home. He wants to have a shot uh, at being more fina- – uh, uh, more. Uh, have more basketball freedom with the with the ball in his hands. He wants to go play with James, uh, with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard and Russell Westbrook. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see what goes on because it seems like if there was a trade to be made for James Harden to head over to the to the L.A. Clippers and for the Clippers to send something back to the Philadelphia 76ers or find a third team to get them involved to keep Joel Embiid in his championship window with certain talent that they could receive, I'm sure that trade would have happened already. Obviously, it has not. So this isn't the first time James Harden has demanded a trade. This isn't the first time that James Harden is willing to not relent on his uh, status as far as leaving a certain organization. When he says he wants to go. And uh, if I'm James Harden, honestly, as a basketball player, I see my basketball twilight on on the horizon. I just averaged 20 points and 10 assists last year. Uh, I helped Joel Embiid get an MVP award. I went to the Eastern Conference semifinals and, you know, took the Boston Celtics to the limit. Even though I had a few games that I didn't really show up for. And you know what? Maybe he just wants to be back in Cali. And maybe he wants to be at a team that he feels like he has the best chance of winning. But who knows? Who knows if there's a trade to be made? Who knows if by the time it hits this time in two or three or four months, uh, James Harden is right back in training camp with a Sixers jersey on, still trying to figure out what's going to happen for the season. I have no idea what's going to happen, but we've seen what's happened in the past. I don't know if James Harden's got to look up into that. Uh, I mean, listen, I don't know if he really had a fat suit on when he was in Houston trying to get traded, but he sure did look heftier than usual in those warmups. And uh, not so long after that, James Harden was definitely out of that situation and in Brooklyn uh, looking svelte and looking just like James Harden that we're used to. But if he's got to bust open that closet and bust open that fat suit to get out of Philadelphia – Lord knows he's probably going to do it. And uh, I'm, 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 I am I'm, don't know, man. I kind of want to see it happen. I want to see James Harden uh, play for the L.A. Clippers because I think the thing that's happened with the L.A. Clippers over the past several years has been health. And you can say a lot of things about James Harden, about how he plays and everything and things of that nature. But one thing you can't say is that he's never not available. He suits up and he plays. And he plays hard. And he plays well. And... He really sacrificed a lot of his shot selection for the betterment of the team. And if you ask the Philadelphia 76ers fans, maybe he could have been a little bit more aggressive on certain times. But who knows? I I think the relationship with him and Daryl Morey, a person he's had a relationship in the past with Houston, probably is uh, a little bit irreparable. But it does feel like it's more to it than just getting James Harden out of there. Of course, you want James Harden out of there, but you also got an all-star, an MVP in Joel Embiid that if you're going to get him out of there, you have to have comparable talent around him or else he's going to say, get me out of here. And you know there's a lot of teams out there waiting and lying in wait, hoping that Joel Embiid, the league's NBA MVP, is going to ask for a trade. So this is why... This entire scenario, how they deal with James Harden has been so crucial and why nothing has been done yet. Until there's a deal that the Philadelphia 76ers can get that they believe keeps Joel Embiid happy, keeps him happy with new teammates, new coaches, probably a new offensive scheme, and all these other things, who knows what's going to happen if they don't nail this trade with James Harden, or somehow convince him to stay in Philadelphia. You might have to start the rebuild process in Philly quicker than you anticipated. Let's talk about these new NBA rules that were approved uh, recently uh, in in, uh, 
this Las Vegas. Obviously, in addition to the Summer League happening, in addition to the WNBA All-Star Game, it was the NBA convention, and a lot of the owners, the Board of Governors, met to approve two brand new rule changes that will go into effect in the 2023-2024 NBA season. One of those rules, much like in NFL football, a second coach's challenge if the first one is successful and as an in-game penalty, uh, oh my God, I'm sorry. I read that completely wrong. Much like the NFL, the NBA Board of Governors have approved a rule change that a coach will receive a second coach's challenge if the first one is successful, much like in the NFL. And secondly, another rule change that was implemented is in-game flopping penalties. Both rule changes were unanimously recommended to the Board of Governors uh, by the League Competition Committee, a group made up of players, union representatives, coaches, governors, executives, and referees to be implemented next season. Coaches have access to a second challenge, and that is something that teams and coaches in particular have been pushing for for years. This is something that's been commonplace in the NFL, and um, why would a team be penalized with a challenge if they're the ones getting it right and the referees are getting it wrong? I don't know. That doesn't make much sense to me. But let's look at it, right? Who won the most coaches' challenges in the NBA? Who is the coach that's probably going to be the person who benefits the most from this coaching change. Let's see. Head coach challenge rankings according to, wow, well, oh my goodness, I'm all over the place with this, but I think I found it. All right. Oh, oh my God. Well, the bottom four, surprisingly enough, in the 2020 2021 season were Billy Donovan, Rick Carlisle, formerly Brad Stevens, and Greg Popovich. Surprising. Who leads the league? Let's see. League. Let's ask. Let's ask Dr. Google real quick. League leaders in coaches challenges. Boom, boom, boom. The in the NBA. Ba, 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 ba. Boo, 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 boo. Uh, we don't know. We don't know. I can't find them. I'm sorry. The Google is not cooperating with me today. But the other rule changes that uh, went into effect is a technical foul. For a flopping. Now, obviously, there are players out there that have done great damage <laughs> to what is and isn't a foul in the NBA, right? Like, from great players to not great players. There are players whose sole responsibility on a team is to draw fouls on your best player, whether it is gamesmanship or taking a charge that, may not necessarily be a charge or getting hit and acting like he got shot happens. There's some superstars that have found ways to sort of game the system when it comes to drawing fouls. I'm looking at you, James Harden. I'm looking at you, Trey Young. I'm looking at you, LeBron James. I'm looking at a lot of Joel Embiid. I mean, Marcus Smart. A lot of these guys, great players, players that don't need to flop. But damn it, we've come so far enough that not only is the flop going to get you a tech, what I think is going to happen is an even better byproduct of this tech for flopping, and it, which has always been my choice of punishment for anything that has to do with messing up the game for us that really enjoy basketball it's the embarrassment. Embarrassment is the number one thing when it comes to punishment of NBA stars. You're going to have that scarlet letter, not just the T from the ref, but you're going to hear it from the crowd. You're going to hear it from the announcers. You're going to hear it from the commentators, the other team's coaches. Once you get that tech for flopping, guaranteed, May not happen in a week, may not happen in a month, may not happen for the, a, a couple of months. But you're going to stop flopping when that scarlet letter of being the guy that goes, ah, ah, 
every single time down is stamped on you. And it doesn't matter if you're a role player, a star player, an MVP. It doesn't matter any of the sort. The embarrassment is what is going to kick it in. A tech here and there, I'm sure by the time we get into the middle of the season, like most rule changes, they'll implement it for like the first two or three months. And then by February, we'll be right back to flopping and flopping and flopping. But I hope for the referee's sake and for the sake of the NBA, they really hang on to this and make people embarrassed to act like they get shot when somebody... Gives him a little slap on the wrist. Cut it out, people. You're better than that. It's a game of skill. It's a game of will. It's not a game of chicanery and foolishness. Let's cut it out. You know, a lot of players uh, have been starting new podcasts. And I think I love this new generation of NBA player podcasts. I feel like at one point it was almost strictly reserved for retired players and, you know, player analysts and people that want to analyze the game from a different lens. And I think recently guys like Paul George and more specifically Jeff Teague have become some of the most interesting voices in the NBA because of uh, their podcast. Now, Jeff Teague, a solid point guard uh, in the NBA, NBA veteran, played for a lot of teams and didn't really say much to my knowledge and didn't, didn't really hear much from him uh, for a number of years during his NBA tenure. I feel like the only story I heard from Jeff Teague even before this postseason uh, was his story about Jimmy Butler in, in, in practice and just him reenacting that epic Minnesota Timberwolves practice when he took the bench players and famously went at Carl Anthony Towns, Andrew Wiggins, the starters of the Timberwolves, saying, y'all need me. And the way he described it, beautiful. Felt like I was in the room with him. But recently, Jeff Teague has had a number of viral clips from his new podcast. And, uh, man, he had this to say about um, being a max player rather than winning a ring. He's got some things that I – pretty much agree with him. I know if we have the clip, let's roll it real quick. That's yeah, a perfect right. segue. So would you rather have a championship or a max contract? Max contract. <laughs> Easy. I hate to be talking about this. I'll be no fool. Hey, I just want to fucking win. And like, man, you get the max contract, then okay, then yeah, you want to yeah, win. Yeah, now it's time to win. Like, shit. Fuck that. Yeah, I want to lose. Got, so I get niggas the got to pay the bills. <laughs> Because yeah. like, I, I will be on a losing team and average 20, get a max deal, then I'll be like, fuck, man. I need to trade me, man. I'm trying to win. Oh, God. <laughs> fuck that. I love that pocket. I love Jeff Teague's answer because it's what I've always thought. Like, rings, I hate ring culture. I can't stand. If there's one thing in the NBA, and I love me the NBA, if there's one thing I really cannot stand about what's turned into the game, it is rings culture. Never mind watching a game. Never mind knowing that it's a team game and it's a team accomplishment. No. Unless you get a ring, your career is invalid. And finally, an NBA player is telling you exactly how it is. Now, would they love to win a championship ring? Absolutely. But, man, I can't tell you how many times I watched the documentary Broke on ESPN. I can't tell you how many times I've been on eBay and I've seen great role players auctioning off their championship rings to help pay the bills years after their playing career is done. I can't tell you how many times I've seen players say, I, I, listen, I saw a graphic on social media on the way here today. It was a split screen. On one side of that screen, have Robert Horry, seven championship rings, $50 million in career earnings. And on the other side of that, that, that graphic was James Harden, zero rings, $300 million in career earnings. Now, I'm not no mathematician, but if you've noticed the trend and you've noticed what Jeff Teague said, he said, "Listen, I'd much rather be on the I'd much rather be on a, a sorry team, average 20, get my max contract, and now the way the league is set up, you can just demand a trade whenever you want. Whenever you're tired of losing, I mean, look at Bradley Beal, 
Look at uh, James Harden right now, even though he wasn't necessarily in a losing situation. I mean, look at Damian Lillard. I mean, get to the bag first. And you know what? There's going to be a lot of pundits that are going to see that clip and see how these players are acting and try and denigrate you for that. Not me. Get the bag. I do not care. I watch the game and enjoy the game enough where I can literally just say, listen, man, give me the $300 million, and then I'll go find my winning situation, man. Like, And it goes to show that this game is absolutely a business. And I'm glad a guy like Jeff Teague, a guy who was, was as mild-mannered as anybody throughout the NBA and has become one of my favorite NBA voices post-career because he kept it so real. And I, I implore you to go listen to his podcast because he gives you a level of insight into the mind of the average NBA player, which, you know, no disrespect to him. You know, I mean, Paul George, multiple time all star, has a very successful podcast. Draymond Green, multiple time champion, very successful podcast. JJ Reddick, incredibly long career. Duke legend, incredibly successful podcast. Jeff Teague, no disrespect, no disrespect. It was just a guy. So his perspective on what the typical NBA player thinks kind of tracks to me. So listen, rings are nice. The bag, in my opinion, is much more important. Secure it, and then if you get a ring along the way, you get a ring along the way. Let's get into some Summer League action, people. Game on the docket. The Houston Rockets taking on the Golden State Warriors. The Rockets are five-point favorites over the Warriors with the over-under of 187 points. Now, they'll probably – well, they'll definitely be without Amen Thompson. However, uh, they do have a very young, fun, and exciting team. Jabari Smith Jr., I don't know if he's going to be able to play. He's already kind of shown that – He's too good for Summer League, but if he suits up, I like the Rockets over here. He absolutely gave hell to former Golden State Warrior James Wiseman just a few nights ago when he dropped in almost 40 points against them, and uh, he looked absolutely sensational in that game. So give me the Rockets to cover on this one, and uh, if he doesn't play, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my eye on who suits up, but it feels like... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean towards that under because everybody in the Summer League, I mean, it's just been some awful offense. I mean, my goodness gracious. Just hit, just smash the Munders anytime you get a chance and you see a team that's playing with a guy who you don't think is going to put up 20 or 30 points because nobody is. I mean, you're getting highs, game highs of 15, 16 points in 10-minute quarters. So if you feel like smashing those unders, go right ahead. I will not blame you, but I'm taking the Rockets on the – you know what, to be safe, I'm going to take them on the money line for this one because I'm not necessarily sure where Jabari Smith Jr.'s playing status is for this afternoon. That's it for today's episode of Count It Though. My name is Kazim Famiwide. I appreciate you tuning in each and every day, wherever you listen to this on YouTube, podcast, Instagram, Twitter – threads, TikTok, it don't matter. I'll find you, and we'll talk about some hoops. Y'all take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your week, and i catch y'all next time. Peace out. In basketball, all players on the court need to work together to achieve success. It's no different from the group chat with your friends all talking about betting. Just like a player needs to be there for their teammates, be there for your friends and make sure they are not spending too much time or money gambling.